Okay, good morning everybody once again. It is now uh, in ship's time, 11.25 in the morning uh, on December 3rd, the eclipse being December 4th in the wee hours, uh, just as the sun is coming up over the horizon. And uh, here to talk a little bit more about the eclipse and in particular the science that is being conducted uh, by the research team here from the Institute for Astronomy out of the University of Hawaii. I'm speaking with Dr. Lika Guhatakarta. She is here as a private citizen enjoying this eclipse, but is a heliophysicist with NASA in her day job, and uh, thought she could give us a little perspective on the science of uh, total eclipse observations and what is learned and why research is done and why, uh, in particular, so much can be learned during a total eclipse. So I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see Lika. You don't need to see me and uh, learn a little bit more about what's coming up and what's expected, what we hope to learn tomorrow. So here we go. Okay, Lika, hi. Hey. <laughs> so tomorrow's the big day. Tomorrow's the big and day. And the equipment is getting set up. Um, Shadi and her team just had the briefing with the captain to talk about some of the logistics. And of course, now everything's up to the weather. But tell us a little bit about what her team's expecting to do, um, what science they're going to be conducting and what they hope to learn from this and why it matters. So eclipses are this uh, rare opportunity, uh, you know, when the moon actually blocks the sun as opposed to an external occulting disk in front of a telescope. And that alone reduces sort of the scattering diffraction pattern. So you can go very, very close to the edge of the sun to start measuring essentially all the physical parameters. But you know, sun is far away. So we do this through remote sensing, basically to get uh, ideas of temperature, uh, density distribution in the corona, and then so we have uh, what Shadia's team is doing. They have uh, telescopes, uh, they have spectrometer. Those are the way, those, those give the fingerprints of uh, elements in the sun's um, atmosphere. And so the imagers are kind of tuned to a few different filters that measure essentially different temperatures in the corona because they're sensitive to temperature. So the range is between one to two million degrees Kelvin. And these are all different iron lines. And these are called the forbidden zone of iron excitation, you know, because the temperature has to be sufficiently hot for you to see them in the visible. So that's kind of a set of experiments with imagers. And then they have white light imagers, which is sort of um, the one we will be seeing with our unaided eyes. And that that's is, where we see the corona that's in its where glory. You see the corona. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's as uh, silvery like my hair. Yes, you're you like know, a corona. I, I mean, it's, it's a poorly white. It is, it is yes. A, it is a light you cannot produce and on should people, this planet. Should people think of the corona um, as the sun's atmosphere, basically? It is. Right? I mean, they shouldn't just. It, it is. is. <laughs> it is. Mm -hmm. I, if you want, I can tell you a little bit more about that, but let me finish the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what other things they're doing. So they have a white light imager just to give like what we are going to see mm -hmm. and map out what the corona looks like, the phase of the solar cycle, how different is it or similar, etc. And the uh, third set of experiment is uh, spectrometer, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of real. Spectrometer still gives the true diagnostics of temperature, of um, you know, density, of velocity, so uh, really important. But the most important part of this experiment, given where we are in the Southern Ocean or near Southern Ocean, is kind of devising a stabilizing platform so that we can do future eclipses from ship. Yeah. So if you think of our planet being 75% water, you know, most of the eclipses happen on water. And if these kind of techniques work out, we can think of more elaborate observational uh, program for future eclipses. So that's what they're doing. What are NASA's motivations? Why does NASA 
invest in and support this kind of research given all the other tools and techniques at its disposal. So again, eclipses provide a rare opportunity for the moon to block the sun's disks completely without any scattering diffraction. So we are able to go very close to the edge of the sun. That's and, and so from the edge of the sun to say 1.5 solar radii is a very dynamic range with high gradient in just about everything you measure, density and temperature. And when you and say velocity. density, explain what you mean by density. Density so of what? Density of electrons. There you go. So the light that you see during the corona is called Thomson scattering of, you know, basic light by the electrons, which creates this poorly halo. And that's why we really can't reproduce this kind of light. So when you see something, it is ethereal, actually. But density is sort of the building block. You know, that's what is really carrying the signature of it. And electrons and protons, I would say, some small amount of um, iron atoms, they carry the signature of magnetic field, temperature, velocity, that's what we are measuring. When you see clumpiness in the corona, it's factor of just density that you have more density there, so there is more scattering. When you see these thin striations going out, that means that the particles are actually escaping sun's gravity. That's the solar wind gently blowing out. Mm -hmm. So and that's when you say velocity, for example, you're talking about the velocity of that solar wind of these particles exactly. basically escaping exactly. the sun's gravity. Exactly. And so, you know, some of the basic questions in heliophysics is still what hits the corona to this high temperature compared to the photospheric temperature of the order of you know, roughly 6,000 degrees um, and, and the corona is millions of degrees hotter, right? So it, it defies logic basically and, and so that's one question. The other is kind of the momentum, right? Solar wind keeps accelerating these particles and then becomes kind of uh, stabilized. That's why we are far, far applying the Parker Solar Probe mission mm -hmm. really to go after this fundamental science question. So why does NASA still support um, ground-based observations? It is to be able to go very close to the sun to get these diagnostic measurements to pull them out but also to test new novel experiments, you know, that would be flown in future. If you go back to right. history, you know, in fact, um, I was the last student of Gordon Newcock who devised this white light uh, telescope with radial gradient filter so you could see the extended dynamic range of the corona. And eventually we created that for space with an external occulter and flew it in the first space mission called Skylab. So there are many, and we are, you know, Shadia's team is devising new ideas, new techniques, which could someday be flown in space. Yeah. So that's a great perspective, and uh, as, you, as you heard, I mean, this is how space instrumentation is developed. You don't want to fly something you don't understand what its scientific value is or how it works and operates and until you've tested it here. So this is another great opportunity for developing and testing new technologies and techniques and observational um, approaches to understand new phenomena. Okay, so for our third and final uh, discussion with, with Lika on this particular segment of the Eclipse journey we are undertaking, we're going to ask uh, an even more fun fundamental question about studying the sun and the, the field of heliophysics, and that is, why does it matter? Why do we care? Why is the, is the knowledge of the sun's working important to us compared to all the other stars out there? What effect does it have on us here? Um, what's the so what here? So let's have Lika uh, weigh in on that question. Lika? Well, you know, to a question like this, sometimes I get flippant. <laughs> Out of the gazillions of stars, the only star that counts is the star, our sun. Literally, it's, it's our life keeper. I mean, we cannot imagine our planet or the solar system or anything uh, without this uh, star. So. Knowing how the sun ticks is very important, but it is even more important today 
because our society has become really technologically vested and I'd say dependent. Everything that has sort of an electromagnetic switch on up, I would say is potentially vulnerable to solar uh, storms, uh, coronal mass ejection, solar flares, any kind of stuff that the sun throws at us, including, you know, high speed solar wind stream, depending on what what technology you are looking at. So if you're looking at GPS satellites, you know, they can malfunction because of the ionospheric scintillation. Ionosphere itself is created by the sun's energy, the extreme ultraviolet and ultraviolet um, irradiance. If you think, you know, it can be as um, significant as our power grids being affected, you know. I mean, they could be shut down by a Carrington-like event, uh, right? Yes, it, uh, you can have brownout, you have a uh, total shutdown of power grid, and these big transformers are really difficult to manufacture. It can be catastrophic, okay? So, and, and as we learn, even the self-driving car, if you think about it, think of all the electronics and software in there. They're all operating on the basis of satellite information, basically. You are modeling, you're making it redundant, but the ultimate sort of input is through satellite uh, data. And satellites can go out on a dime. So what we do in heliophysics is we try to understand observe the sun, try to create a um, predictive model based on science, sometimes empirical. We share our knowledge with NOAA, who actually creates the space weather. That's what we call this present day environment that the sun has created for us. Much like terrestrial weather, it's space weather. And much like you don't leave home without kind of you know, forecasting, carrying umbrella, wearing your jacket anymore. Think of space tourism. What do they need? They would want to know if there's going to be an extra lethal dose of space radiation because something is coming directly in their way. It can not only affect their electronics, but it can affect human health with radiation damage. Uh, the, the examples are enormous, okay? So you might ask the question, well, how did we live a century ago? A century ago, we didn't live a life that was so technologically vested. Yeah. Today we do. One single episode can bring us to a standstill. So the question is, what else should we study? It is the sun, and it also affects climate. Absolutely. Not only with total solar irradiance, but also with spectral solar irradiance that creates the ionosphere, which then propagates down oh into stratosphere. So ultimately creates our weather. Absolutely. So yeah. both the physics and just our survival as a species with the technology we have developed, it is absolutely a necessity, not a choice, that we study the sun. Well, there you go. That's the motivation and the logic and reasoning behind the field of heliophysics. And uh, now hopefully you've got a greater appreciation for why the sun and understanding its workings and its physics matters so much. It does matter to you. As Lika said, you know, we are so technologically dependent and all of our technolog technology is uh, very susceptible to uh, being impacted by the sun's behavior. So understanding it better, being able to model it, predict it, um, means a lot. So hopefully that helps you uh, get a better appreciation for our own star, which, as Lika said, we couldn't live without. So more to come as the uh, total eclipse approaches early tomorrow morning. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.